this. Okay, so you know that the word for peace is shalom? Okay? And, uh, and like when the Lord, he would go into a room and he'd say, you know, peace. Well, in the original Greek, and, and I think I told y'all this last week, he was saying, peace is yours. You know, it wasn't like this, peace. You know, he was like, peace is yours. Okay? Well, the word peace, shalom, means housing, divine health. So that means never getting sick. Food and good relationships in the Hebrew. That's what it means. I have no idea. It's an absence of injustice, violence, chaos, disruption, all of those things. So when you say peace be yours, when Jesus said peace be yours, it's literally he is imparting that blessing to go into your life if you receive it. I had no idea I learned that this week. Isn't that cool? So peace be yours. If you need a job in Jesus' name, you'll get one this week. If you need a house, Jesus' name, you'll get one this week. If you need a financial breakthrough, a health breakthrough, get it now. Peace be yours in Jesus' name. So Father, we just ask that the word of God go into our heart, penetrate, and bring about transformation, Father. I thank you that when I speak your word, when I preach your word, Father, that I am not just speaking words, but life and spirit are being imparted in Jesus' name. Okay, so we're going to talk about doctrines of devils on the power of God. And we're going to begin Psalm 138, verse 2. It says, I will worship towards your holy temple, and I will praise your name. For your loving kindness and your truth, for you have magnified your word. Above all your name. Now that's kind of interesting. Because if you view the word as this book right here, which it is definitely the word of God. If you view it that way, then you're going to think about this, that the word became flesh. Okay? So he was saying, like, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. At the name of Jesus, every tongue will confess. They're not going to confess at the name of Yahweh Rophe or at the name of El Shaddai or Elohim. They're not going to bow to that. It is Jesus. So the Word became flesh. His name was Yeshua, and he has been exalted above all the other names of God. Okay? And in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word is God. Okay? And so you have exalted your word above all your names. The word name literally means, well, let me tell you what magnify means. It means make great and to promote. And name is honor, authority, and character of God. So a name is what marks an individual. Like whenever you guys hear my name, but those of you that know me, you immediately picture my smiling face my wonderful sense of humor, okay? But you, you picture me as a person, right? You don't see Sherry spelled out in your head, right? So my name, and even if you hear someone else's name, Sherry, you will immediately think of the Sherry you know, right? When I think of Ramona, I think of all of her and all her kids and everything I've learned about her, okay? And so whenever you think of Jesus, here's what you got to understand. Guys, when you release the name of Jesus by faith, you are releasing all that he is. Did y'all know that? You're releasing his authority. You're releasing his character into the situation. And it also means reputation. And see, the name of Jesus, is this a magical formula? The seven sons of Sceva, they heard what Paul was doing. They're like, hey, let's go hit the most demon-possessed men in Ephesus and let's cast the demons out. They show up, the demon's like, you know, I know Jesus. I know Paul. Who are you? And so in order to release Jesus and all that he is in his name, you got to have him on the inside of you. Yeah. And you know what? You also got to know him. See, a lot of baby Christians or a lot of Christians maybe are backslidden, they try to use the name of Jesus as a formula. Then whenever they don't get their results, they become offended and they go even further away from the Lord. But you got to understand, when you became born again, you're no longer dating. You took 
speak his name. You're in a marriage relationship with God. You're in a union with him. And so that means that everything he has in his bank account is ours. That means everything he has as far as love and relationship with us, it's ours. Okay? So when me and my husband were dating, I couldn't go and open up a bank account in his name. But now I can even sign his name. <laughs> I can get credit cards in his name. I can do whatever in his name. Because we're one. And so it says that the honor of God, the authority of God, the character of God has been magnified above his word. It also means fame, report, and renown. And uh, I got this statement here. God will keep his word. Now you got to hear this because a lot of people get confused. God will keep his word and he will not violate what he has decreed even if it means losing his reputation. God will keep his word, and he will not violate what he said he's going to do, even if he loses his reputation. In Psalm 115, 16, it says, The heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's, but the earth he gave to the sons of men. A lot of people are like, if God exists, why does all this bad stuff happen? If God's such a loving God, why doesn't he stop this stuff? Okay, that's what happens, right? I, I used to think that, God, why don't you stop all this stuff? I mean, you got authority. Here's the thing. He gave earth to man. Man gave earth to the enemy. And so God, because he gave his word to Adam and Eve, he could not take the earth back because he would have violated his honor. And so, from the beginning... He had plan A, and that was Jesus. But God is the type of God that he will keep his word even to his own hurt. So everybody puts all the blame on all the evil that goes on in the world on God. Right? Have you ever heard someone say, man, why does Satan keep doing this? Why does Satan, you know, keep murdering people? Why does Satan keep doing that? You never hear that. Because the enemy is very good, even in the Christian believer, of getting us to doubt God's character. And so when you think that God is withholding something from you, when you think he's out to get you, when you think he's not going to protect you, then how much faith are you going to have to pray? And he knows that if he can get that wedge between you and him, if you fight, pray for something and it never happened, and you're like, well, I prayed, I tried that, that didn't work, and you've got that wounded faith in you, how much confidence are you going to have if your body gets hit with something, to stand on the word of God. See, the enemy's very sly. He knows exactly how to do it. <laughs> so we got to stand on the truth that when God says it's Christmas, get out the Christmas trees. You know what I mean? When God says it's Easter, paint the eggs. And I'm just, you know, kidding. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you study the Easter egg, it's kind of you know, interesting. But anyway, so God, if he says something, it's a guarantee. But here's what can stop it. Are you in agreement with it? When he, cut, when, when he went to Gideon, he said, the angel said, Oh, mighty man of valor. Are you looking at me? And I'm like hiding in a wine press, you know, just trying to protect your harvest. When he comes to you and he tells you how much you mean to him, and when he tells you what your destiny is, when he tells you what your ministry is, do you believe it? It's kind of embarrassing. Sometimes when God starts talking to you. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like he will begin to pour out his vision for you. And then is your heart like, well, no, because I did this other day, or I'm still doing this, or I'm doing that. Let me give you a secret. You know how God sees you? He sees you as heaven sees you. He sees you as a finished body. Okay? So anything that is contrary to that finished product, he sets about a plan to turn up the heat just enough to get rid of what is prohibiting you from fulfilling your destiny. And I think some of you need to hear this. Evangelists, if you're an evangelist, the lie of the enemy is that you're too simple to evangelize. And one of the weaknesses of evangelists is they often fall into the sin of the one they're trying to evangelize. 
So just know that. Just be aware. There's always a weakness in whatever gift you have. And you gotta be aware of that so you can't make a trip up. He just wants you to know he's pleased with you. It has nothing to do with what you do. And so the Lord gave man dominion. And whenever man decided to, you know, release the, the authority of earth over to the enemy, the Lord didn't stop him. In John 1 14 it says, The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory. The glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Philippians 2, 7 through 11. I love this one. It says, he made himself with no reputation. The name of Jesus was something like, you know, unless you had been healed of him, it's like, Jesus of Nazareth? Did, did his mom get pregnant with him before her, him, you know, her and Joseph married? You know what I mean? There was a stigma. There was a reputation that surrounded the Lord that was not good. I had lunch with a lady this week, and uh, we were talking about, um, you know, being slandered. And I said, yeah, I've had a lot of that. And uh, she said, well, what have people said about you? And I said, um, let's see, uh, rebellious, Jezebel, oh, and witchcraft. And I'm sure there's other things, too. And she goes, what? Do they not know you? No, they don't. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that was what was happening is the Lord literally became of no reputation for us. I mean, have you ever been talked about? It's not pleasant, is it? Especially when it's bad, you know? And so that's what happened is he carried this, and he was from Nazareth. That's like Clovis. For real. Why would you move to Clovis? You know, I mean, I, I hear that. Why are you here? Like, how'd that happen? It's like a mystery. No one knows how you end up in Clovis. Right? <laughs> it's like no one is from here, except for my husband. He's from here, huh, Gigi? Well, but you're from New York. It's like, how'd you get here? You know? So it's like, if no one wants to come here, but you know what? God loves the city. But that's kind of what he was from, Nazareth. He's not even, you know, a Judean. And, like I told you guys before, where he was raised was actually more Gentile than it was Jew. And so there's some people that, you know, suggest that he probably did not look like a typical Jew. That he might have even had hair to about right here, not long, because of where he was from. We don't know, but he definitely made himself with no reputation. He took the form of a bond servant, servant coming in the likeness of man, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name, which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of the Father. Word is logos in the Greek, and it means divine expression. I'm giving you the literal Greek, okay? Divine expression, in other words, Jesus the Christ. If you want to know what the Father thinks, look at Jesus. That's his expression. That's his word. That's what he has spoken. That's what he's released is the person of Jesus Christ. God has exalted Jesus Christ, the expression of the Father, above his own name. God told the serpent that the seed would crush his head. That Aramaic word is rule. And he said, he's going to crush your head. You're going to bruise his heel. Okay? So the seed is the word, right? And so the word came, the seed crushed his head, and he's been ticked about it ever since. <coughs> so what does he do? He tries to mar the seed. Your image of Christ, your image of God, he tries to mar. And so, due to this lack of understanding that his word is exalted above his name, um, a lot of people and a lot of believers have believed doctrines that have put them in a passive state. And we're going to look at number one in a second. And you might want to write them down. But here's the thing. Any doctrine that puts you in a passive state it is not from God. It says that the violent take 
the kingdom of heaven by force, right? Like I said last week, I don't want to get into politics, but Trump, the one thing he told uh, some Christian leaders was, you guys are soft. You know, we got to, there is a militancy about the church, and I'm not talking a physical militancy where, you know, we start beating people up and forcing them to confess Jesus as the Lord, but there is this determination. See, with the military, they, they don't have time for distractions. When they're in a battle, they can't, you know, oh, check their cell phone, you know, for text messages and wonder if my bills are going to get paid. Like, they have to be completely focused, right? And so that's what we're supposed to have. Guys, we are not here to get born again and kind of skim through life and then go to heaven. Salvation is not a change of destination only. It is a transformation. It's the indwelling of God on the inside of your body. And, and our job is to further the kingdom of God through destroying the works of the devil by healing the sick, casting out the devils, and, and delivering the good news. That's our job. The minute you think that you are here just to go to work every day, go to church on Sunday, and that's it, you're not very useful in the military. Okay? There's always more to do in the kingdom of God. There's always more. Like, the Lord's been challenging me. Like, how many times do you go to Walmart and you don't even look for anybody that I want to minister to? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> 75% of the time? That's not good. Have y'all heard of Todd White? The dude with the dreads and the toe shoes? He wears his weird toe shoes. Um, that guy, it was so funny. From the time he enters his hotel to up the elevator to his room to gas stations to restaurants, he gets people saved left and right. That's all he does. It is a part of his life. I'm not there. I realize that. I am not there. And then what's the motivation? What's the motivation of ministry? Is the motivation of ministry because you actually love the people that you're ministering to? Or is it to add a notch in your belt? Or is it to grow your church? Or is it to grow your ministry? In the Lord, he was so bold, he preached one sermon and lost his entire congregation, except for 12. Yeah. And then he's like, y'all going to leave too? Uh, we have nowhere to go. <laughs> We're with you. It wasn't like, no, Lord, we love you. We believe what you said. Come on, we don't have anywhere else to go, so we might as well stay. <laughs> you know, that feels good to hear. <laughs> you know? And so we have to get to the point where our motivation, guys, is kingdom. It's kingdom. Because we love the king. And we don't want to see anybody go to hell. Yeah. They can choose it. But we're like special ops that, you know, go in and rescue people into the kingdom of the Son of His love. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Yeah. And in Jesus' name, there will be a people that rise up in this city and do it. You know? Alright, number one. This is the First, doctrine of the devil. Okay? And this might freak some of you guys out. Because if you've been raised in church, if you've heard these things taught, you know, my favorite God is in control doctrine. Uh, I had two people tell me that today. Well, God is in control. And y'all heard me talk. No. What, how that works is he gave us the responsibility in front of the kingdom. He is not in control of women getting raped, children molested, fathers beating their kids, mothers uh, abandoning their kids, he is not in control of that. Okay? So I got, well, God is in control. And I said, well, actually, <laughs> you know, he gave us the ability to choose whether we align ourselves with his will. And so you might have heard some of these guys, so I don't want you to freak out. And if you have any questions, since we're a smaller group tonight, you can ask. Number one, God has all power. And you might be thinking, whoa, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I know he's got all power because he said so. All power, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, right? Yeah, and then he gave it to us. Again, God has limited himself to his word. So it's like conduit. If you don't have something where electricity can travel through, what happens? It causes harm, right? And there's no focus. 
okay? So what happens is the Lord, he is all powerful. He is all might. He is incredible. But he has decided to focus his power through conduits of people that have faith. So if he can find faith, he can do anything. But he has to find the faith first. When Cain and Abel gave their offering, and the Lord was pleased with Abel's, but he wasn't pleased with Cain's, right? You know that it says that. If you look in the original language, guys, when Abel offered his sacrifice and God took pleasure, this is what happened in heaven. I remember saying this years ago. The Lord literally, God, literally sat back on his throne, looked at everybody. That's what it means to look around in amazement and said, did you see that? Why? Because Abel did it by faith. How did he know to give the first one? How did he know to give the fat? You know, he's kicking back, taking care of his sheep. His brother's working like a dog in the field. His brother's like, well, surely God's going to accept my sacrifice because I worked harder for it. Not like my brother Abel, whose name means vanity, who's just been laying around out in the pasture while the sheep eat. Right? And then to his shock, to his horror, he didn't accept his sacrifice. He accepted faith. And I'm telling you, there is a clash that is beginning to occur in the body of Christ between those who are radical in their faith. They don't want balance. It's a nice term for, you know, don't go overboard with faith. What the heck is that? Faith is what pleases him. Can you go overboard on pleasing God? You know, well, don't get all weird and cookie, you know. Well, I'm thinking when the Lord said, eat my flesh and drink my blood, that might have been a little cookie. And then did you notice that when he would communicate with you, he would never communicate with what you were wanting to talk about. <laughs> like, Nicodemus, he comes up to him and says something, and he goes, well, unless, you know, unless you're born again, you won't see the kingdom of heaven. Well, I'm supposed to go back to my mom's womb. <laughs> like, it's just like totally... You know, people would ask the question, and he would say an answer that had nothing to do with it. And you know what? What it had to do with was their heart. They're coming to him with one question. He's answering the question in their heart. We are supposed to do that. <laughs> Don't get into doctrinal debate and all that junk. Don't get onto, you know, if you have to, you know, observe the Sabbath, and you can't eat pork, and you got to wear dresses if you're a female, and... You know, you got to cut your hair if you're a dude. Don't get into those debates. Go to the heart of the matter. Ask Holy Spirit, what's really going on here? Why do they need laws? What fear do they have in their life? What lack of trust do they have in their life that they need external laws to control their behavior? You know what I mean? Is this helping you guys? Okay. <laughs> so, until the Lord returns, the earth is ruled by the enemy. The only answer to his ridiculous, you know, dictator rule is us. Okay? And let me tell you something. He is scared of you. Okay? We like don't even say Satan's name. He might hear you. You know what I mean? It's like this weird thing. Like he's all powerful. But he's actually scared of you. The Bible says that if you resist him, he flees in terror. So he screams like a girl and he runs. <laughs> okay? I'm serious. It scares him. People that know who is in them and they don't fear him, that is scary to him. Because he loses control over you. Okay? I just love that night when we were singing that song. Uh, what was I'm not scared of you, devil, and it sucks to be you. I mean, it was an incredible night of worship. And people get nervous. I'll never forget when we were singing in Amarillo at that event. And I started saying that, and people were batting their eyes like a deer caught in headlights. And you could tell like they were afraid he was going like, to walk into the room and just start smiting them all. But we got to understand are we going to believe the Bible or not? Because Jesus said, I give you authority over all the supernatural power of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Are we going to believe that? You might be like, well, you know, my, my friend, you know, Ted, he got hurt, you know, and he started following God, but man, he got 
Not Gail Moss's wife. I mean, all kinds of stuff happened. Well, I'm sorry. I follow the gospel of Jesus Christ, not the gospel of Ted. Okay? We don't go by the experience of people. We go by the Bible. Jesus is not a model for you. He is a model of you. As he was on the earth, so are you. Okay? They couldn't kill him. A riot. He starts a riot. He preaches a sermon so controversial that they're like, stone them, throw them off the cliff. I mean, you know, have you ever done that? Have you ever heard a sermon that just really ticks you off? So multiply that times ten. So they're like pulling them over to the edge of the cliff, and all of a sudden they shift, and he just walks right through. Tried to kill John, boiled him. That didn't work. I'm going to put him on an island and he gets the book of Revelation. It's incredible. They couldn't kill Peter. Shipwreck? No. Nothing could kill him. Because they believed that I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy and nothing will hurt you. No thing will hurt you. I want y'all to leave with that. I don't know why I keep stressing that. You guys need to leave with that. Don't be afraid of what the devil can do. Make him afraid. I mean, play mind games on him. Like when he comes to you and he starts attacking you with fear, be like, it's not going to work. Just stop. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, just laugh. Do you know why God laughs at his enemies? Because he knows their future. And he knows that any time they try to attack you, they're going to pay for it. See? And please do not say anymore, and y'all heard me say this, I'm under attack. Ephesians says that you're seated in heavenly places with him right now. It says that the devil is under your feet. Who's the body? Us. That means we make up his feet. The God of peace will crush Satan under your feet, right? So we're above. He's beneath us. Okay? And the word authority means legal jurisdiction. That's what it means. So it's like a cop. They have legal jurisdiction to enforce the law. So a lot of the reasons that people go through a hard time is when they get hit, they either think they've sinned and that and God is punishing them, which you know, if you sin, you open the door, you know, just shut it. Just shut the door. Repent, be done, right? Or they think that, you know, God is against them or something, and you'll even hear pastors and leaders ask you, Well, you must have sinned somewhere. What did you do to open the door to the end? I remember I used to think that all the time, God, I must have done something wrong. You know, I've been attacked and stuff. And I remember I was on 7th Street, and he said, what if, instead of asking me that every time, you realize that the reason you're needing resistance is because you're making the enemy nervous? Hmm. So you mean I'm not doing something wrong? I'll let you know. <laughs> we don't have to make the case. If we've done something wrong, he will let us know. Right? So don't say you're under attack. You live from a place of victory. Fight from a place of victory. Don't just lay down and take it. So basically, if we believe that God has all the power, then what we do is we just keep sitting back waiting for him to do something. And then when he does something, we're like, well, he didn't come through for us. <laughs> have y'all noticed that? Have you ever done that? I remember doing that when I was immature as a Christian. God, don't you love me? Why didn't you answer my prayer? You know, have you ever done that? Come on. Am I talking to somebody? Okay. Okay. So let's look at Ephesians 3.19. This is the key to the fullness of God. This is the key to walking in the fullness. When you're born again, your spirit man is immediately perfect. Holy Spirit comes. Your uh, soul, your mind, will, and emotions have to be transformed by the renewing of the word. That's Romans 12 too, right? So it says... To know the love of Christ. That word know is by experience. Have you ever had a person that you knew didn't like you and they're talking bad about you, but they come up, oh, hi, how are you doing? It's so good to see you. And you're thinking, liar. <laughs> you hate my guts. You do not want to see me. Stop. You know what I mean? Well, if we don't experience, it's, it, it goes beyond words that we're reading. 
If you don't experience the love of God in your life, if you don't recognize it, it will hinder you from walking in fullness. And so it says to know, to experientially, experientially know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. It passes the mind. Okay? That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. The fullness of God, guys. That's just like Jesus walked in. He was given the Spirit without measure. Okay? Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us to him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. So Paul is saying, I pray that you know the love of God experientially. Why? So that you can be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above even all that. Above what? To know the love of God so that you can be filled with all the fullness of God. And Paul's saying, my prayer is so small for what he has in mind for you that I don't even know. Do you see how far we are from these realities? You know what I mean? A day where you never get sick again because you're full of the fullness of God. Germs, they touch you and they die. You know, can't live in your body. Yes. You know what I mean? Man. Now, notice what he said, though. According to the power that works in us, it is to the same degree of the power that works or energy in us. Okay? So, all of us know, in order to have lights, we have to flip the switch. Okay? The best way for you to have that power operating in you, which the Greek word is energeo. It's where we get our word energy. Okay? And it's like a generator. So the Holy Spirit is a generator, generator of power on the inside of you. But if your gas tank is on E, then you're not going to have much power. Right? So, how do you have power? It's the Ephesians chapter 5. Do not be drunk, which is dissipation, but be ever filled with the Holy Spirit. How? By speaking to yourself and to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. It's the presence of God. I go to the office today. I had a little bit of a you know, chaotic day with some things that occurred. And I get in there, and man, I start decreeing. You want to get yourself stirred up, you start saying, Father, I thank you that I am the dwelling place of God. I thank you I've got the Holy Spirit. I thank you that I am anointed within and without. I thank you that I am smeared with the power of God. I thank you that when I go places, the enemy runs because he knows heaven showed up. I thank you that demons are scared of me because you're in me. I, and you just start doing that kind of stuff. Yes. Well, you get fired up. You're preaching to pictures on the wall. You're like, let's go, man. And then all of a sudden, it shifted. It's like, oh, oh, you know, going nine miles per hour. And then, and the stillness came in. So I'm sitting there. And I was like, what am I supposed to do with this? And he's like, just sit here. And I said, okay. And so I just sat there. And there's this weighty presence that came on me. Yeah. It lasted for about 20 minutes. I didn't have anything to say. And then it lifted. Wow. See, stuff like that. Prayer is powerful. It works. It changes. You may not see it, but it works. So, all power is resident in you, but the enemy will send false doctrine, have truths and lies, and he'll choke it out. Yeah. And the enemy hates prayer. That's why you go in prayer and you get sleepy, or someone calls you, or, you know, you get distracted, all that stuff, right? So when that happens, it's because the enemy's trying to keep it out. Now, you can have all-day prayer. That's what I do. I, I got to find myself praying as I'm driving. I'll find myself praying as I'm at the house for no reason at all. I'll just be praying. But I have those set-apart set apart times where I go into my secret place, and that's all I'm doing is talking with him. Okay? Romans 16.25 says, The way you're established is by understanding the revelation of the indwelling of God in you. God in you. Yeah. 
and just ponder that. Number two, God will do it all himself. He doesn't need our help. You heard that one? First of all, it's stupid. It's the principle of number one. The entire idea of God becoming man is so that Holy Spirit can live in us. So that he could redeem us and Holy Spirit can live in us. Because he has limited himself by his word and he has also limited himself by his plan of living in people instead of boxes. Okay? And he needs us to go out and preach the gospel and he needs us to lay hands on the sick. He needs us to do that. He needs us to open our mouth and speak because we believe. You know what I mean? And so a lot of people are like, well, you know, he can just send an angel or show up himself. You know, he will. He'll do that for sure. But his main mode of transportation, guys, is you. But it puts people in a passive state. He literally cannot do anything, guys. Unless it's first decreed, spoken, and prayed into existence. All of the Old Testament points to Jesus Christ. So he said in Isaiah, I can't remember where it is. It might be like 42 or 43, but it says, see, I'm doing a new thing. I spoke this before it happens. That way you know when it happens that I spoke it into existence. Yeah. It says by his word he spoke and he framed the world. We have him in us. When we truly believe something and we release it, now listen to this, it is impossible for it not to happen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you truly believe and you speak it, and that goes good or bad. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? We have amazing power to believe, even apart from God. Then you got double money, man. You get the Holy Spirit, the spirit of faith, the spirit from the Father. You believe what he's telling you. You release it. It literally creates your future. I remember one time the Lord told me, he said, well, the reason everything's messed up is you spoke it into existence a year ago. <laughs> I was like, what? What, what? what do you mean? And he showed me how I've been speaking something. Like the other day I was training a client, and I, she said, I'm broke, like money-wise. And I said, you know, I don't mean to be like nitpicky or anything, but I never say I'm broke or I can't afford it or anything like that. I'll say, I don't choose to put my funds in that place right now. You know what I mean? Because you can actually afford whatever your heart sits on. Okay? It's where you choose to put your money. And so, but constantly saying, I'm broke, I'm broke, I'm broke. Guess what? She's always broke. So I said, if you want to change your financial condition, you need to get in line with the Word of God because Jesus actually died for your prosperity. He purchased it with his blood. That's in Isaiah 53. The reason faith pleases God is it's an entrance or a door. It's a way for him to move on earth. In Ezekiel 22, 39, this is incredible. You know, we've got those people that they're just waiting for God to judge everybody. Yeah. Get them, God. Kill them all. You know, yeah. you got those people. And then you have the other people like, oh, my babies. Just like everybody. <laughs> Here's the thing. It says in Ezekiel that the Lord was looking for someone to intercede and he couldn't find anybody. So he had to send judgment. If he could have found one person that was praying for Judah, they would have not gone into captivity to Babylon, but he couldn't find anybody. So if God can do everything and he doesn't need us, then why the heck was he looking for someone to pray? Uh, number three, we hear this all the time. Well, don't you know that all you can do is hope and pray, sister? Just hope and pray. Okay. American hope is wishing once upon a star. Okay? God's hope is expectation. You expect what you pray for to happen, right? And so here's the thing, is this actually reveals a lazy inner man and a lack of understanding how this all works. And it also reduces, like, uh, 
all you can do is pray? What is that? What does that mean? You know what I mean? It's like prayer is the most powerful force on history or on earth. Remember I told you guys about the school in England that was uh, ran by the Christian man? Something Howard, I think, was his name. And they would pray uh, when there were you know, battles during World War II and how the Nazi uh, fighter pilot said that out of the blue, their plane would get knocked off course. And then the English men that were up, because we weren't in the war yet, they literally could see bullets bouncing off an invisible field, not touching them. Why? Because they were praying. Prayer changes history. It changes your history, and it changes the history of nations. Biblically, hope is expecting what you pray for to be done, and it's not a wish list either. It's knowing the will of God in the Word, coming into agreement with it, which is faith, and praying it out loud. And beware of anybody, including Christians, that say, say don't get your hopes up. I've actually had that told to me. I was believing something, and they said, well, don't get your hopes up. If you've ever had your hope dashed, if you've ever had something where you prayed for it and it did not happen, it's almost scary to believe in it. And so when people tell you, you know, I just want to tell you, don't get your hopes up because I've done that before. You know, I got carried away with this faith thing, and I prayed a lot, and things didn't happen. You know, so I'm just trying to help you not to be disappointed. I was actually told that. You need to tell them to shut up. <laughs> and when I was told that, I was an immature believer, and so I believed it. Like, oh, oh, man, you know, I didn't, I didn't think about that, you know. So it actually put me in this passive state where I wouldn't hardly believe for anything. The Lord had to show that lie. All right. Number four, God can do anything he wants. I've heard that. God can do anything he wants. Nope, he needs faith. And here's the other thing. He won't violate your will. You can resist him. You know what I mean? He, he won't do it because he gave you freedom of choice. A lot of people are like, well, if God knew that Adam and Eve were going to fall, why did he create man? Well, I don't know all the answers, but I will tell you this. He wanted the people to love and to love him. And he didn't want robots. A computer, whatever you tell it to do, it does, unless it's got a software glitch, right? But he wanted people that chose to love him instead of those that were forced to. Okay? So here's the testimony that God's going to have. In a perfect world, man chose to disobey him. In an imperfect world, we will choose to obey him. <coughs> It's not your environment that determines disobedience or obedience, guys. It's your heart. Okay? All right, number five. If it all works out, it'll be God. Okay? Let me tell you something. When the Israelites left Egypt, they're like, yay, woohoo! We left Egypt, we plundered all, we got all this stuff, now what? Well, he's like, well, let's go. You know, so they take off walking. God literally leads them to the Red Sea. He doesn't take them anywhere else. He goes first to the Red Sea. So then Pharaoh comes to his senses. What the heck did I just do? So he gets his army, right? He goes after them. All of a sudden, you got a sea in front, the army of the greatest empire behind you, and they are throwing a temper tantrum. Hmm. What are you, bring us out here to kill us? Is that why we're out here, Moses? And they freak out. Have you ever had that happen? It's like people think that, yeah, I got victory. And then the minute they get in victory, all hell breaks loose. And then they're like, well, you gotta hear God. Have you ever done that yourself? I have done that. And so Moses is like, oh my gosh. So he goes to pray. <laughs> this is what God says. Why are you whining to me? That's literally the, he the Hebrew of Aramaic. Why are you whining to me? Don't you have a staff? Use it. Whining, tears, manipulation, promises. If you do this, I'll do that. It doesn't move God. Faith moves God. Okay? So they get through that deal. Then they have their first 
first battle, they win. I mean, it's like, you know, it's cool. But then they fight again, it doesn't go so well. Here's the thing. Before they crossed into the promised land, they had about three battles. After they got in the promise, they had 38. This, if it all works out as God, is not a truth because usually the greater your destiny, the more you are walking into the promises, the more you're coming into the reality of what God has promised you, then all hell breaks loose. Because the Christian that begins to live in the promise of God is unstoppable. Okay? So if things start breaking out against you, do a hallelujah dance. I don't know. Go for a job. Do a high five. Laugh at the enemy. Do something because you're doing something right. And a lot of people are like, well, I don't want to do that because what if I get off track? Well, I'm thinking God can find you and put you back. Okay? Are you going to trust God or not? It's that simple. We get so worried, we start overanalyzing this stuff. Let's your son law. This freaked me out when Dr. Rado was talking about this. When, and some of you have heard me say this. You know, he, I mean, he, he like, it's incredible what that man did and how many books he wrote. He would wear out his 20-something-year-old assistants in his 80s. Wear them out. And uh, so one day Dr. Rado asked him, she said, how do you know all this stuff? Like, how is this even possible? And he goes, the first thought I get, I do. I mean, she was like, what? The first thought I get, I do. Well, how do you know it's God? Well, little girl, if I can't be mature enough to know God's voice, I probably shouldn't be in this business. And I was like, oh my gosh. Can you imagine? The first thought he would get, he would do. And that's why I accomplished so much. Wow. We got to mature in hearing the voice of God. And the way you do it is you walk. And if you go the wrong direction, he can put you back in the right. You know? I want y'all to read this story in your spare time. 1 Samuel 14.1 and then 6 through 15. Jonathan, and y'all heard me talk about this. Jonathan, Saul's son, while everybody's hiding, Jonathan is not in his armor bearer. They're like, hey, let's go pick a fight with the Philistines. And his armor bearer's like, whatever you want to do, I'm with you. Two people. They had to share a sword, right? So they're, they're, they're like, okay, so this is how we know it's going to be God. If it's God, when we start climbing up the cliff, the worst military strategy on the planet, if we start climbing up the cliff and they see us, we're like, what, you want to fight? Want to fight? Like, it's going to be this whole thing. That to him was, that would be God's will. But if we climb up and they're like, and they don't see anything, then we know it's not God's will. He picked the very thing that they would normally do as a sign that God was with them. <laughs> and he beat them, and it, you know, everybody's like, what's going on? <laughs> Jonathan and our armor bearer, they got the Philistines running, let's go. Your bravery, your courage to take God at his word and to take a risk can impact everybody around you. Can I tell you, the church doesn't need safe people anymore. Does that freak you out? We don't need safe people anymore. We need people that are willing to be labeled, people that are willing to go out and do the crazy stuff. When I used to help with uh, youth, the pastors were freaking out because the youth pastor took some kids uh, and he went to go raise dead people. <laughs> And I'm like, go, go find them, go, I don't know, can you get them bored? I mean, we'll let you in, you know? And they're like, you gotta have balance, but you are a pastor. So they didn't go. We don't need safe people anymore. Number six, it's all right to believe the Bible, but you gotta be realistic. Ugh. Right here, that realistic. It irritates me to know it. And you've got to use wisdom. Be real and use wisdom. That is unbelief emotion. When you hear those two words, more than likely it's unbelief emotion. Was it wisdom for Jesus to pick a betrayer to be on his uh, apostolic team? And put him in charge of the treasury? You know what I mean? God uses his wisdom to confound the lies. He uses things that are 
are so outrageous and absolutely ridiculous that you actually think you're insane to do what he's telling you to do. He tells you to, to buy a building when you have no money. He tells you to go buy a house when you have no money. He tells you to have a kid and raise them up for the word when your parents didn't know how to raise you. You're raised on drugs and alcohol. What am I supposed to do with this now? This baby. He tells you to marry the guy that works at a bakery that didn't finish high school. But he's the best man on earth. You know what I mean? He always comes at the most inconvenient, inopportune times to tell you to do stuff. Yeah. That's the secret. If you're comfortable with and he tells you, if what he's telling you to do, you can do in your own strength, it's not right. Right. I'm serious. He will always come and tell you to do something that is absolutely outrageous. How many of you have heard of Heidi Baker? Okay. Raised in religion, had a doctorate, was ordained, and God says, hey, I want you to go to Mozambique. What? I want you to go to Mozambique. I want you to save that nation. <laughs> sure. Okay. How do I do that? And literally, she just began to take the steps, and she is literally saving the nation of Mo Mozambique. She's an apostle. Little tiny lady. And God took it further. For years, if she tried to, I hated watching her. If she tried to preach, she would be under the power of the Holy Spirit so much that she would literally lay on the ground with the microphone, giving her message. And I'm like, Can you, this is, I don't, what is this? And I was just get so frustrated. And the Lord was like, people have to look past the outwardly offensive. You gotta understand that. And look at what I'm doing. Is it wisdom? Does it make sense for the Son of God to be born in a manger? Huh? Yeah. Poop from animals? Unclean and unsafe for having a newborn baby? That's where God picked. 